The panelists will discuss the value of presentations at treatment provider sites and having real-time vacancy information for primary treatment providers and the recovery community. Um, we're gonna have, we've got six panelists here. Um, they're gonna come up and speak for a little bit and then we'll try to make sure that we have some time for Q&A afterwards. Um, our first speaker is Dylan Soap. He is the clinical program director of Valley <coughs> Hope, right, in Kansas. At, I don't know how to pronounce that, in Kansas. You can, you can tell more about it. Anyway, welcome him. Good morning. Uh, you may have to turn this down for me because uh, I tend to get a little excited talking about something like uh, recovery from addiction. And so uh, she told me I have 10 minutes and she's going to poke me if I start going longer. But um, I want to start by saying my name is Dylan. I'm an addict. And uh, I work as the clinical program director for an inpatient treatment facility about an hour north of here uh, called Atchison Valley Hope. Uh, I was a patient there. Yeah, there's a few of you in the room. Uh, and so I was a patient there about 16 years ago. Uh, and through the course of uh, recovery, uh, I've had the gift of being able to go back to school and get an education and earn degrees in the field of counseling. Work as a counselor there as assistant director. Um, and now uh, work as the clinical program director. And so, uh, um, you know, I, I just share that to, to, to say that the, the miracle of recovery, uh, anything's possible. Uh, and so as we see some patients come into the facility and, you know, they, those that are least likely to succeed, I remind our staff, uh, someday they may be the director of this place. So, uh, anywho, I want to, I just want to share that I'm very grateful that uh, the the Oxford House World Convention asked me to come in and share. Um, you know, it's an honor to get up here and talk about uh, recovery, talk about the Oxford House working with treatment providers. Um, and so, thank you. Uh, and, and so I just want to reiterate that I'm very grateful that I was asked. Um, and I particularly, I don't know, has anybody seen this Jackson, the convention planning chair? Oh yeah. This guy, give that guy a round, man. I don't know where he is, but uh, you know, I gave him a bunch of trouble just, you know, committing to this. And then I <laughs> see the scope of how many other people and how much goes into this. And I feel like I owe Jackson some amends that uh, <laughs> I was, uh, you know, I kind of blew him off just a little bit and didn't return the, and he was persistent. Uh, and so he really uh, got things in order for uh, us to be here today. And uh, I want to, you know, uh, say thank you to the entire, um, uh, convention committee because it takes a whole lot of work to put something like this together so thank you guys I want to start by really just kind of uh, recognizing what you guys probably already know to be true and that's uh, the success uh, that Oxford House Recovery has in the lives of addicts and alcoholics. And so uh, this convention, all these people in this room today, I think uh, just reaffirms what we already know as a treatment provider, that sober living works. You know, that Oxford House works, that uh, uh, people, uh, uh, if it wasn't for something like Oxford House, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, in recovery wouldn't have made it. Uh, what we know in the treatment world uh, is that, you know, I talk about this uh, with our patients, is that uh, it's, a, it's known that the longer a person's engaged in treatment services, uh, the more likely they are to be successful. It means the longer they're in inpatient treatment. Uh, every day they're an inpatient, the likelihood of their success goes up. When they uh, discharge from inpatient treatment and they step down to like something like intensive outpatient treatment, what we know from, from our uh, uh, research and uh, the field will say is that the longer they're in these treatment services, the, the chances of their success continues to increase. If they step down from something like IOP treatment into like a continued care group therapy, their chances of success continue to increase. And, uh, but I, I want to share, even as a treatment provider, uh, that uh, no matter what we do, uh, we can only get people so far as far as likelihood. Uh, and probability that they're going to stay clean and sober when they discharge. And so uh, we, uh, as a facility, Valley Hope, uh, identify and, and share that, you know, we think people ought to be engaged in some sort of treatment services for up to a year. And that those people who are engaged in services uh, the longest are, again, more likely to be successful. But it only gets you so far along. Somewhere 
uh, treatment services, uh, you run into what it can do for you. Uh, and, and you kind of plateau. And at that point, uh, that's where we find that sober living, sponsorship, 12-step meetings, home group, that's where all that stuff's going to sort of take people from, you know, uh, whether it's uh, 50 to 75% likely to move it into those people that just uh, 100%, they're going to do recovery. Um, and so uh, uh, we, I really, I want to share that, uh, uh, you know, this, this sober living, this Oxford house, you guys are living it, you know it, but it works. And we see it on our end. Uh, you know, we recognize, we do something called a Renewal Day. And the third Friday of each month, we ask our alumni from Kansas City, Topeka, Lawrence, St. Joe, around this Midwest area to come back and join us on the third Friday of the month. And they celebrate their one-year birthdays, or they just celebrate their time in recovery. They come back, they give to the patient group, they share with them what's working. Uh, and if there's a theme that's consistent again and again in these one-year birthdays, two-year birthdays, three-year birthdays, uh, one of the things is I see them participate in treatment. Uh, that, that's always a theme. Another one is their loved ones tend to be involved. So those people that come back with a year, two, three, four, five uh, years clean and sober, their loved ones participated. But one of the themes that I see again and again and again is when people come back and they celebrate a year clean or two years clean, they say one of the most important things I did when I left treatment was I moved into an Oxford house. You know, I moved into an Oxford house. And, and I don't know that people appreciate at the time when you're sitting in treatment and you got 15, 20 days clean and you're trying to make some decisions about what you want to do in your life, I don't know that people, especially if they haven't lived in one before, if they appreciate that just one single decision to move into an Oxford house you know, they talk about playgrounds and playmates and, uh, um, you know, uh, how do I avoid old using people? I say, you don't even have to work very hard at avoiding old using people. You just got to go hang around new clean people. And that's who you'd be spending your time with. Uh, and so, uh, but by making a decision to interview and uh, move into an Oxford house, you automatically just uh, reduce your risk of relapse and <coughs> increase what we call protective factors for recovery. Um, you know, and we honor and celebrate that. At Valley Hope, uh, we even had a counselor, a guy by the name of Troy, who's been around uh, uh, the area here and worked in our Overland Park office, and he used to do a dance. If somebody was at their cup hanging and they said, hey, I, uh, I'm going to move into an Oxford house when I discharge, he had an Oxford house dance that he did. <laughs> and I'm going to do it for you. This is the first time I've ever done this dance. And so you guys... And man, I'm going to do it for you just like he did it. So if I look corny and I look silly, Don't blame this on Troy M. And he'd do this. Got you on video. <laughs> that was his Oxford House dance. And so if a guy got in, if a guy got into an Oxford House or a gal moved into an Oxford House, uh, you know, Troy gave him uh, his signature Oxford House dance. Uh, and so, uh, um, you know, I really... Um, I want to share, I asked our clinical staff and uh, some of our team, I wanted to kind of be practical here, and, and I asked them some things that they thought were uh, barriers, roadblocks, challenges uh, from patients uh, transitioning or bridging the gap from inpatient treatment uh, into an Oxford house. And I also asked them to share uh, with me some of the successes, some of the things that seem to really work well with regard to transitioning from inpatient treatment um, to uh, to uh, Oxford House Sober Living. Uh, we have, and I'll share those with you guys, uh, we have uh, long at Valley Hope uh, welcomed uh, Oxford Houses in the Kansas City area or anywhere around to come into the facility and speak. Uh, and so uh, our moderator earlier talked about, you know, part of this panel is, you know, talking about the things that help uh, transition people from inpatient or from treatment into Oxford Houses. And one of the things that we find real successful, see we talk, I, every lecture, I give a lecture every week, uh, uh, multiple times a week patients are hearing about the importance of sober living. You know, it just, uh, uh, you know, how can you go wrong with sober living? You know, week by week rent, you know, uh, uh, places where you get fellowship, fun, recovery, which is I think the, the, uh, the title of the convention today. Uh, they're just really, uh, it, it's all good uh, from our perspective. And we welcome uh, uh, the Oxford Houses to come in and share with us. And one of the things that we find real successful is, you know, we can tell, uh, you know, I'm an addict in recovery and I can share about, uh, uh, I don't have an Oxford House story and that's only because Lawrence, Kansas is not very Oxford House populated. 
you know. Uh, and so that was one of the challenges that they said is that we need more Oxford houses, you know, uh, particularly in uh, communities that don't have them. Uh, um, but it's when, it's when people that come in and share, you know, I imagine when I got clean, an Oxford house would be a place of a bunch of squares. You know, that was my idea of, of getting clean and people. I don't mean to, to, you know, but I don't know if any of you guys moved, before you moved in, did you think to yourself, man, I don't want to go hang out with a bunch of dull people that are in recovery. I mean, that was my yeah. perspective of just yeah. life in recovery. Um, but man, when you guys come into the facilities and you share, man, and, and you come in and you relate to people and you sit and hang out with them and you talk to them and, and man, you give them hope, you give them inspiration, you engage with them, you help them realize that, uh, man, you know, a guy can, a gal can move into an Oxford house and not turn into a square, you know, I can still be a fun guy, you know, in recovery, man. Uh, and so, uh, um, you know, one of the things that I think uh, works really well with our patients, uh, anybody in the Kansas City area, I don't know if you're on camera, if I should even be saying this, but uh, how many alumni, you got any Valley Hope alumni in the room? <laughs> whoop, whoop. Man, yes. Uh, uh, and, and just out, were most of you guys, did an Oxford house come into the facility and share while you guys were there? And man, what did that do? Introduce them. Yeah. Anyway, well, I'll go yeah, on, man. Yeah. I'm still. I'm in like a round of applause, guy, man. That's good stuff, bro. So I think I'll start just uh, quickly. How many? She's. Oh, I'm already getting poked. I'm getting poked. All right, this is almost done. Uh, then he's going to give me his five minutes. So I just want to share real quickly uh, some of the things that uh, our staff identified as some challenges. And so I don't prepare. I don't propose that I've got solutions to this stuff or or what Oxford House ought to do to deal with it. But I just want to share with you what our clinical staff uh, the observations they made. And the first one's Suboxone. Uh, you know, and, and I want to share is that uh, the field, the face of addiction is changing. Five years ago, we had uh, opiate addicts that were on pills. You know, uh, today the opiate addicts that come into treatment at Valley Hope are often are IV heroin addicts. Um, you know, and they have burned a lot of bridges and they, uh, they come in often with very few uh, people left in their corner. And sober living is one of the things that they really need. Uh, but they also are unsuccessful, a history of relapsing, and unsuccessful uh, staying clean. And so they, they, uh, sometimes they want to do medication-assisted therapies and want to do Suboxone or medications like that. And uh, oftentimes we find that when these patients reach out to Oxford Houses, they're met with, uh, you know, we don't accept uh, people on Suboxone. The other one's transportation to interviews. We're an inpatient facility about 45 minutes to an hour away from some of the Oxford Houses. Uh, sometimes it can be difficult for people to get to uh, interviews, and so, uh, um, you know, uh, it just is what it is, uh, but that's one of the challenges that uh, people run into. Also, uh, our staff talks about uh, sometimes that, uh, you know, uh, they don't get calls back. Patients uh, make calls to houses, leave messages, ask about interview times, and they don't uh, get a call back, uh, and so that's something that they shared about. Um, and the other thing is, you know, Oxford House is uh, it's so ideal that, you know, a patient uh, or a person's using and the Oxford House immediately catches it. They got six months clean and sober, then they uh, relapse two or three days, the Oxford House catches it, they say, hey, you need to go to inpatient treatment, you need to get back on the wagon or whatever. And then we, we deal with managed care companies, insurance companies who say, this person's clean and sober for six months and used for two days, we'll give them three days of treatment. And then the Oxford House says, no, you need to have 30 days to come back in here. And, uh, it's just, you know, and they don't have the ability to self-pay to remain in treatment. So that's some of the challenges we run into. Uh, real quick, uh, success. Uh, here's some things I want to share with you guys that the, uh, uh, our staff uh, and clinical staff and our patients have shared about what's successful in working uh, uh, inpatient facilities uh, with Oxford Houses. And that's the convenience of the website. I don't know which of the young uh, generations coming into the Oxford Houses here. And like I got scanned when I came in and there's this, all this technology. And so that's very helpful uh, is that the, the updated information is on the website about availability, updated phone numbers. 
Uh, also the support given to patients when they reach out and you guys answer the phone that kindness that love that care taking an interest in a confused scared addict alcoholic goes a long way in uh, helping patients uh, transition in and also some houses uh, in the Kansas City area have been known around here to do emergency interviews uh, you know a patient has to discharge on a Wednesday they can't don't have anywhere to go and the uh, house typically interviews on Sundays and they say we can do emergency meeting on Wednesday night we got all the residents together we'll just do it then uh, that's something that's real uh, helpful. Also, staggering interview times. So if you got uh, five uh, houses in the Johnson County area, you're doing interviews at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and 7 o'clock, and that way people can come. Uh, um, yeah, that's my stomp to end. Uh, uh, also, up-to-date postings. Um, and again, uh, I just want to share with you guys, uh, um, I'm very uh, grateful to be up here and, and with a panel of other uh, treatment providers, uh, you know, and with uh, this audience. Uh, I just appreciate uh, uh, Valley Hope, uh, uh, you guys asking us to speak. And I, I feel very blessed to be close to the Kansas City area. We have so many Oxford House options. You know, there's Oxford Houses in Kansas and Missouri, Topeka. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we're really blessed as a facility uh, to have so many great uh, referral partners in the Oxford Houses. I appreciate all you guys' time. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay, now we've got Ed Smith. He's an Oxford House alumni. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and also... Oh, and his title is Housing Director for Bridges to Change. Whoop, whoop. Yeah. Good morning, family. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ed. I'm a man in long-term recovery. And for me, what that means is I haven't had to have a drink or a drug since October 2nd, 2003. So, uh, you know, I think that you're going to hear a lot of uh, repeated information, I mean, from us. Um, I have the fortunate, so I'll speak from, at first, a personal experience. Um, I am alumni from Oxford House, um, also uh, worked for Oxford House for 13 years before moving on. Um, what I can tell you on a personal level is that uh, after about 13 treatment centers that I went through, the one thing that was missing in my life was that family, that hope, that connection that, that, that Oxford House provides. Um, I know that the last time, I'll say 13 treatment centers and several stops at county jails and things like this. I mean, uh, the one thing that Oxford House uh, f did for me was um, a bunch of men uh, that were there for me as family without expectation. They were friendship and family without expectation when we didn't have anybody else there. Um, so the organization that I work with, um, I'll, I'll be honest with you, years ago, um, I could not stand them. Uh, I thought they were, I thought we were in competition and uh, that's the way as, uh, as an Oxford House, still a proud Oxford member, uh, uh, that's how I looked at it. And uh, in moving on, what I, what I know, what we do, what, what Bridges to Change in Oregon does is we provide uh, intensive outpatient treatment, we provide medication assisted treatment, we do prison release, we, there's a myriad of things we do. What, what I get to do is I get to um, assist the different programs in the organization with housing, uh, housing for them. These are temporary things. And it's hard for me, it, it's hard for me to transition into that because of what I know with Oxford House. What, I, what I've been able to do in the short time that I've been there is to, to create a little bit more hope, but the bottom line is we are, that it's not Oxford. I know that the one thing that's missing is that family, that hope, the fact that you never have to leave as long as you stay away from active drug and alcohol use, right? Right. So what, what the people in my organization can do, and I think everybody up here can say the same thing, is we can bring them in, we can dust them off, we can give them the services they need that, you know, and, and, and make sure that they're standing up a little bit again, that they're able, able to function again. But what we need from you is we need, the, we need you as family. So what, I, what I've already heard is, you know, um, 
and I'm fortunate as to, to the fact that I'm very much tied to Oxford still. I still have uh, friends on staff, friends throughout the state. Um, my wife is an outreach worker. <laughs> so, so I'm fortunate uh, in, in everybody in my organization, even though I, I touch every piece of, of housing within our organization, everyone in my organization also knows that I come from Oxford and I still have a strong tie. So, so it's hard for me on one aspect because I probably get 30 emails a day or phone calls a day from my staff because they can't get a hold of anybody in the houses, right? So phones work, people. So what we need from you guys, what, what I need from you is I need the ability for the members to come in because Treatment isn't the last thing for them. They, you know, we've dusted them off, we've cleaned them up. We need you to wrap your arms around them and bring them in and show them that family aspect. So I really encourage you some things you can do. Um, I encourage you to assign somebody in the house, somebody in the house who's on that vacancy website that he spoke of earlier. Answer your phone. Return the phone calls. We need you guys to give these people hope. Even if you don't have an opening, return the call. Help them find other houses. The other things that you guys can do is doing presentations inside groups, things like that. I'll tell you right now, I don't, I'm, I'm not a counselor, but I do know from the groups that I see, the people I work with, that they would love to have somebody say, hey, can I do a, can I do a group for you? Um, I know that the people in my organization would jump at the, that because bottom line, they get the, that hour off during the day while you guys do some service work. There's lots of things that you guys can do, um, you know, going into the treatment centers. Even when you're not doing a presentation, reaching out saying, hey, can I stop by? Can I be part of you guys? Can I, you know, if you're an alumni from a treatment center, um, I went through a, the, the last treatment center I went through, um, for five years I went every Sunday to a, a group just to reconnect with the men, to let them know about Oxford. I mean, every man that went through that program, we made sure a group of us in that five years that as Oxford House, we wrapped arms around them and made sure they had a place to go. So I just want to say thank you for everything you, you guys do. I want you guys to give yourselves a round of applause for being here. And just know that we can't do this without you. That next addict, that alcoholic that's out there, let's get them in, get them in detox, get them in treatment, but know that they, their chances increase 87%, 87% success rate going from treatment to Oxford House. Because the bottom line is that family is going to be there the rest of their lives. And that's what you guys are to me. And I appreciate being up here, and you guys have a great convention. Okay, thanks, Ed. Um, our next speaker is Tom Hill. He's um, Vice President of Practice Improvement for the National Council for Behavioral Health. Morning, everybody. Uh, so yeah, my name is Tom Hill. I'm a person in long-term recovery from addiction, and for me that means I haven't used alcohol or drugs for over 26 years. So we're going to be overlapping a lot of what we talk about today, but we're all going to say it in different ways. So I, I've, the first thing I want to talk about is that you can go to the best treatment in the world, uh, the best treatment money can buy, and at the day you leave treatment and go back into the community, if that community is not ready to support your recovery, you are almost at risk of going back to using again. We all know that. So how many folks in this room know about the term recovery capital? So I'm going to teach you a new term, recovery capital. 
And that can happen on an individual level or it can happen on a community level. But what it means is, uh, what kinds of supports and systems do you have in place when you go back in the community to support long-term recovery? And so that, that can be a lot of different ways. And first and foremost, we know that people need a safe, sober place to live in order to have that environment, to have that peer uh, generated environment to help people uh, build recovery capital, right? So that's a new term. And, and I always say, I tell people who don't know any better that in early recovery, it's sort of like being airdropped into a foreign country where you don't know anybody, you don't have the currency, you don't know the language, you don't know the culture and customs, and everything is completely alien to you, and you have to start over from scratch. So we know that people need a place to live, but we also know people need to belong and be with other people like them in community, and that's what Oct Oxford House provides. So how do we communicate that with, uh, with treatment people and the, lar and the larger um, world at large, you know? Um, so I think there's some outreach efforts. So the National Council for Behavioral Health, one of the things we represent is all the state associations of treatment providers. So every state has their own association, and you need to know that. So uh, in your state, in your locale, what are the treatment providers you need to be in touch with? And, and statewide, because so many decisions are made statewide, um, how can you uh, do outreach efforts with the entire association? So that may be something you know already. If not, it's something you just need to incorporate. There's diff different levels of outreach here that we need to be, as recovery ambassadors and recovery advocates, we need to be communicating with. Because some of them know, but guess what? A lot of them don't know. So the old system was that there was prevention and intervention and treatment, and then this thing people sort of called aftercare, but nobody knew how to uh, put it together, and it sort of usually dropped off. So when people did leave treatment, they did go into communities that weren't ready for their recovery. Um, what we have now is we have a, a little bit more sophisticated look of a recovery-oriented systems of care, and that, that doesn't stop a treatment that goes into recovery support. So it really goes into what's happening in the community. And Oxford House, we know, is one of those key elements of community supports. So part of the education that we need to be doing is why is recovery housing so important? And let, letting people know that it's an essential ingredient to recovery. Because if people, you know, in the old days, people said when they left treatment, Good luck, you did a great job, you did all your treatment work, avoid slippery people, places, and things, go to meetings and everything will be all right. And we know that everything wasn't always all right. So we also need to know, let people know what Oxford Houses are and what they can and do accomplish. And we have data for that. Oxford House has lots of research and lots of data that you can use uh, as part of your arsenal when you're communicating and educating these issues. Um, and the, I mean, the other thing that we need to communicate that the combination of treatment and recovery supports, treatment and Oxford House, creates better outcomes for everyone. So treatment providers, especially in this day and age, are much more cautious and concerned about what the outcomes look like. And as, as, as payment systems change, more and more treatment providers are going to have to prove that what they do is effective. So what they do in treatment and how that goes into recovery supports is the combination that we know works the best. And so developing those relationships between Oxford House and treatment providers is key. So like I said, some treatment providers get it and some don't. Um, in the olden days, a lot, most treatment providers were two hatters. They were clinicians and they were also people in recovery. That's not so true anymore. So we can't take that for granted. And so we need to educate people, what does recovery look like? And we are what recovery looks like. We're what successful recovery looks like. So, you know, I just want to impress upon that everyone in this room is a recovery advocate and everyone in this room is a recovery ambassador because everywhere we go, we're shining examples, we're living proof of what it is. And they don't always have the opportunity to see that, the general public and treatment people in general. So really important. Um, I think in terms of people leaving residential, we provide a soft landing, 
right? We have a place directly for them to go. For people that are doing outpatient, we have a safe, supportive environment for them to do while they're still in treatment. And for people that return to use, or relapse is another way of saying that, we have, uh, if you have those relationships with treatment providers, you can get those folks back into treatment that much faster. And we know, that's, that, you know that when that happens in a house, it's, it's a crisis period, and getting people the help they need is really, really essential. So the final thing I just want to talk about is hospitality, because <clears throat> I think uh, Oxford House is the epitome of hospitality. Um, and when you think about what hospitality is, open doors, open houses, and to really take that seriously. And when you're doing outreach with treatment providers and treatment provider agencies, have them over to your place. Let them see what not only what recovery looks like, but what recovery housing looks like. So that they know they're sending people to a safe, supportive environment. They know they're sending people to an environment that's going to cushion and help them in early recovery with other people around that can support that. And so I, I think that that's really where I want to leave off is that whole idea of hospitality because we do it so, so well. We provide for, for our own in a way that in, in the past nobody else did. And that we can also extend that hospitality beyond our own community to the treatment community, to state, state systems, to the criminal justice system, and to the world at large and let them know what we've created here. Need a little water. I'm going to finish off so my other speakers can come to the mic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, next we have Shauna Taylor. She's a drug and alcohol counselor at Royal Life Treatment Center. Okay. Hi, guys. I'm Shauna. I am a woman in long-term recovery. What that means to me is I haven't had a drink or a drug since October 23rd, 2014. <laughs> uh, I, so I went to a six-month inpatient treatment facility and I was blessed to find a home that would do a phone interview for me because I was in Yakima and wanted to go back to Tacoma, Washington. So I found a house that accepted me. I did my interview process seemed like the most stressful thing ever. Like, what do I say? How do I answer these questions? This was my first time even in recovery. So I had about three weeks before I got out, and my dad went and paid my deposit. And my house actually held my bed for three weeks, a little bit longer than they should have, but they did me a favor. And uh, CBS wanted me to move into an Oxford house. I'd been in an inpatient facility with 15 women, and I had no desire to live with any more women. So I was going to go and do it for, you know, just a couple weeks and then get my own place. I was good. Two years, eight months later, I moved out. <laughs> so during my time in Oxford, I decided that I wanted to do something different and go back to school. I tested into the lowest level possible and decided to go into human services. I wanted to be a drug and alcohol counselor. I'd had two of them during my time between treatment and drug court relapse. And it hurt right here. Because this is somebody that I became super close with. Somebody that knew all my deepest, darkest secrets and lifted me up when I was unable to. So I have a job now. I'm a drug and alcohol counselor at a detox center in Lacey. Thank you. <laughs> um, one of the things that I've noticed is that uh, People, so I've got people that have come through treatment 10, 12, 40 times. And I always ask them, you know, what are you going to do differently? And they just kind of look at me like, what do you mean? And I wonder first, how is this the first time you've been asked this? <sighs> Second, have you ever heard of Oxford? Because it worked for me. And if it can work for me, it can pretty much work for anybody. <clears throat> so I am very big on talking people in, you know, going to Oxford. Now, since I only work at an eight-day detox, they have to go to treatment first. And it's kind of my loophole, like, hey, you need to have 30 days clean, but hey, you really need inpatient too. So it's kind of my way of convincing them, if you go do this first, then you can do this next. Because people don't think they need treatment, which is another thing that surprises me. So um, one thing I want to say, how many of you in here are an HSR for either your house or your chapter? Nice, thank you. So one of the things I 
want to stress to you most importantly is going to your treatment centers, your IO inpatient, outpatient, and going to different places. I know some people will find one treatment center that's got a treatment commitment on that one day a month they have off and they go to that one all the time. There's no way you're gonna spread the word if you're going to the same treatment center all the time. Thank you. Second, I can't stress it enough and we're all gonna say it. Check your voicemail, answer your phone. Because there's people. <laughs> there's people that are in treatment trying to get into an Oxford house. It's gonna save their lives. If you don't answer your phone or return their call, there's no way you're gonna help them save their life, okay? Phone interviews, please, by all means, accommodate these people. If they're on the other side of the state or another state away, you can't expect them to come in for an interview. And just be open and remember that somebody gave you a chance once. All right, thank you, Shauna. All right, our next speaker is Jenna Nisbet. She is a recovery consultant um, at the Center for Social Innovation in Texas. Okay. Let's just get this situated so I can see it. Hi. Is it activated and ready to go? So my name is Jenna Nesbitt, and um, some of y'all from Texas know me as Jenna Sheldon. People still call me that, um, but <laughs> and, and I don't often need the microphone. But um, I'm a person in long-term recovery, and what that means for me is that um, I have been in full remission from alcohol use disorder since 2012, and um, have not used. Thanks. I haven't used any illicit substances since um, September 25th of 1998. And um, I'm really um, thankful to be here. I'm gonna back up from this thing. I mean, my voice really carries. Okay, maybe, how's that? Is that better? Okay, great. So, um, you know, I'm really excited to be on a panel of such incredible experts. And um, Tom said it best when he said, we're all gonna be talking about things that kind of overlap. I don't normally do slides, but I was afraid that if I just kind of got up here and decided I would wing it, that I would talk forever. So this is your typical treatment pathway. Um, we usually will see some sort of poten potentiating event. Um, it's usually sort of external. Um, maybe the law is involved, the state has invited you to consider doing something for yourself to make some changes, or maybe a spouse has threatened um, to leave, or a job, so on and so forth. This is typically what um, the treatment pathway we've gotten used to talking about um, in our field, which by the way, I'm a clinician, but I'm also a person in recovery, as I said. And um, one of the things that I think is important to note is that every state has a state-funded point of entry. Um, in Texas, it's called an OSAR, stands for Outreach Screening Assessment and Referral. And it's good for you all to know that because the federal government sets mandates that um, govern over the priority populations and the states who get the funding have to report back the success rates or the wait lists regarding those. So, I, wanted to, I put together a little scenario that I thought would make sense for y'all. It might sound a little bit familiar to you. I'm not gonna read slides to you, but this is Joe B. Um, I have anonymized him as Joe Blow is his actual name, and <laughs> which is a little punny. Um, <laughs> but um, he's a young Caucasian middle-class male, early 20s, college age. He comes from a, you know, a good family. Um, he's real typical of what we see. He's had one treatment episode before um, in college. It was a little, little intervention, two-week stay, that his parents really persuaded him to go do. Um, and so he's back. And um, Joe has a, a great, you know, supportive family. They do see him as the problem. Um, he's, he's engaged in treatment. No one's engaged his family in treatment, however. He does his 28 days, he do, he's doing everything he is supposed to do. Um, he's going to outpatient, he's going to meetings, and um, then he meets her. Y'all don't villainize her. I wanted to put a little humor in my presentation. I had also made a slide that 
that said, or it could be him and it was rainbow, but I took it out because I just didn't know how everybody would <laughs> feel about that. But, um, but it's a her in this case. Uh, because Joe's a figment of my imagination. So um, he's going along just fine. He's doing everything he's supposed to be doing. Um, he's doing his 90 and 90. He's doing his aftercare, which we talked a little bit about as kind of popular vernacular, but it's really been kind of fluid as to what aftercare really means. Um, and so he's doing okay. But, you know, Joe, he's... Um, like many people, things start to feel better, and so we might kind of step back up off of his regimen, you know. This is really common, not just with people like us who are in recovery from substance use disorder. This happens with people who have mental health dysregulation issues. This happens with people who are on um, treatment protocols for diabetes. I know, because my mom is one of them. This happens to people who have other chronic um, and potentially fatal diseases that have a little bit of potential for recurrence. And so this isn't something that is just about us, just so y'all know this. Um, so Joe's starting to feel a little bit better. He's also working really hard because he wants to go to school and he has to pay for school. And so he's not really getting into his meetings as often and when he gets there, he's not staying. Um, and he you know, has essentially forgotten about his outpatient groups. And he's doing the best he can, and he's having a hard time now keeping up with all the pressures. Now in Texas, we did a little evaluation on our recovery support services. We've done it for a couple of years now, and the more recent evaluation shows that there's a little bit of a dip in the nine month point because people are now having to deal with life on life's terms. And if you're interested in that evaluation, see me after this and I'll get you a copy of it. But the fact of the matter is, Joe's just having a hard time keeping up. Meanwhile, um, you know, he's not talking to anybody. The house is great, because Oxford House rocks. You know, y'all are doing a great job. They're being supportive, they're checking in on Joe. Um, but he's just not really feeling like talking to anybody. He's afraid of letting people down. He's been here, he's done that, and he's faking it till he makes it. He's doing his best job. And so at one point, Joe gets vulnerable. His Co-workers are like, please come out with us, go get a drink. You, you know, your alcohol's not your problem, right? So Joe does this. He does this because alcohol wasn't really his problem. He was just partying too much in college. And um, he returns home and subsequently is asked to leave uh, because he has violated charter. So what went wrong with this situation? Everybody, like, everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing, right? Oxford House is doing what they're supposed to be doing. Joe's doing what he's supposed to be doing. Um, but, you know, he really had maybe not as many recovery supports in place or recovery capital that Tom talked about. Maybe what he had wasn't sufficient for him. Maybe outpatient and 12-step groups um, weren't going to cut it for Joe for whatever reason, even though he's in the evidence-based practice of an Oxford house. Um, so one of the things that I think is important for y'all are working with your treatment providers you know, we keep thinking of treatment as intensive residential. That's not all treatment is. Treatment is so many more things than that. This is how we've conceptualized treatment for so long in the order of priority. And when I worked in an intensive residential treatment center and when I ran an outpatient, I would go over and talk to the residents about, you get your completion certificate on Tuesday. That's not the end. That's the beginning. That's where the hard work starts because treatment and particularly intensive residential treatment that's a crisis stabilization mode I've been knocked on I got to keep it moving so um, we have the episodic treatment cycle really became kind of popular with um, the um, the uh, the 80s we had managed care and so and then it became more popularized with parity which is a good thing don't get me wrong we need parity but um, we've seen a lot of people cycling through treatment and then very most recently the opioid crisis has spurned a lot of treatment entry uh, because people are going and doing medical detoxes and then entering into 28 day treatment episodes to deal with opioid use. How do we break the cycle? When you guys work with treatment providers, it's kind of funny that Mr. Malloy talked about McDonald's earlier because I was like, oh, I've got a McDonald's slide. And um, the point of the slide is no clown is going to tell you how to do your recovery. When you guys are working with treatment providers, you need to know that there are more choices than just what we tend to conceptualize. 
as availability. It's not just treatment, it's about recovery supports. And so um, many of the folks that you'll work with, they've, that's all they've ever known is that in and out, in and out sort of cycle. This is the array of opportunities, and this is right off of SAMHSA's website, um, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services. I'm kind of waiting for them to change the A to uh, either U for use, Substance Use Mental Health Services, or maybe make the A for awareness. But people can do um, their recovery in a myriad of ways, and you don't even have to go. I didn't go to treatment to get my recovery initiated. Um, and I'm very, I'm very blessed. That was just my pathway. Peers are the missing link, I think. And what's so beautiful is Oxford House. You guys have been doing this for 43 years now. Happy belated birthday, Oxford House. <laughs> Y'all have been doing this for, now we've got recovery coaches and we've got peer navigators and you guys have been the forerunners in this since, you know, forever. Um, so when you are working with your treatment providers or recovery support providers or recovery community organizations, that's, I really want you to broaden the paradigm here. It's not just about residential. Um, when you're talking to them, ask them if they have peers that you can be working with. Um, and get involved with your local recovery-oriented system of care. If you're in an area that doesn't have a recovery-oriented system of care, uh, be the change and start one. It's not hard. If you want to know how to do that, you can email me, or you can probably email anybody on this panel, and we can tell you how to get started. You want to give a message that um, recovery is really not just aftercare. Aftercare, we kind of just think of 90 and 90, right? If somebody were to just pull you on what does aftercare mean, that's a phrase that usually comes to mind pretty quickly and it's way more than just 90 and 90 and it's way more than just AA or NA for some folks. We know that people need to do smart recovery now or refuge recovery or women for sobriety. There are so many pathways to recovery and it's important for y'all to get to know them all. So one of the things that you want to do besides sharing about the evidence-based practice of Oxford House is to share that recovery is possible and that there is hope. And you can also share a little bit about the research around recovery support services. Again, see me after if you want to know a little bit more. I got a lot of it. You're integral to this process. Um, these treatment providers and recovery providers, they need you because it's not ethical to discharge somebody with nowhere to go. It's, it's not okay. So you need to be talking to them. But also you need them. And one of the things that I think is important is that you guys don't get caught up in some of the local politics. I know it's hard, everywhere has politics, but sometimes you'll be in a smaller community where this treatment provider over here is talking about this treatment provider over here. Try not to get caught up in that. It will not do you any good and it certainly isn't gonna work for any of the residents you're trying to help. Um, be the diplomat and collaborate wherever you can. Um, and then also, um, don't just look at residential providers like has been said before. Um, there are federally qualified healthcare centers, we call them FQHCs, that you can be talking to. I have to read my slide now to see where, oh, um, emergency departments, please go talk to them. There are social workers that work in there, there are recovery coaches that work in there. Um, they need to have you as a resource to know where to go. If you have a local sobering center, we have a couple in Texas. Um, they need to know about you as well. There are all kinds of resources for y'all. Another, I think, important thing is to drop that recidivism language. This language is stigmatizing. It's cool if you guys talk to each other in your 12-step 12, you know, 12 sort of vernacular. We do that in my own house. I married a person um, that I 13th stepped right out of a group. And uh, Cradle robbed him at that. He's 13 years younger than me, so... We use that language with each other jokingly because that's how we identify. But out in public, this language, you need to hit rock bottom. Oh my gosh, y'all, that's death now. Rock bottom, there's no coming back from that. So these are just some things that I want y'all to be aware of and please represent yourself as a more well-rounded vocabulary when you're talking to your treatment and recovery mm -hmm. providers. Um, you can change the landscape just by how you talk to other people. Here's one nobody else has talked about. There's some unethical shady stuff going on out there and you guys might hear about it from your residents. Please be unafraid to report that. Sometimes it may involve people that you like or admire, but nobody can do anything about it if they they don't know about it and so it's really important for you guys to be 
talking about that if you hear about it. Back to Joe. Joe got hooked up with a recovery coach. His, re like his roommates really kind of helped him out. They wrapped up around him, got him local um, services with the local recovery community organization. The coach helped him get navigated. He went over to his local department of assistive and rehabilitative services where they talked to Joe a little bit about his protections as a person um, with a disability. He got access to school funds. He didn't have to work his butt off as much. And as you can see here, um, he got a better job and really started getting involved with his local recovery community, volunteering at the local RCO. So he really worked out well for him. He got to move back to an Oxford house and continue his relationship with her. And it was a happily ever after kind of scenario. So in closing, um, you know, just, just remember, it's not just about treatment, it's about recovery. And we really need for you guys to be supportive of the recovery support services in your area and the recovery oriented system of care. And did I say, I think I forgot to disclose, I'm not here representing Center for Social Innovation. They are my employer, but I do have a variety of independent contracts that I work on. And so if you need to find me for anything, there's my contact information right there. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Daniel Fox is going to wrap it up for us. He's gonna, I'm going to give him about three minutes, so we can two minutes, so we can leave a little bit of time for Q and A. He's a um, outreach worker in Colorado and Oxford House alumni. All right, wrap it up. Can you hear me out there? Yeah. How about now? I don't like talking to these things. My name's Daniel, I'm a man of long-term recovery, and what that means to me is that I have not put any mind-altering substance in my body for 12 and a half years. <laughs> a, a, direct, a direct result to that is that in 10 days, I'll have 10 years working for Oxford House, who would have thought? I spent most of my life locked up in prisons and juvenile institutions, so for me to be here today, to be employed, to be sane, and to have a little vocabulary, which I still need to work on, like they said about educating yourself to be able to go into treatment programs or talk to professionals. Uh, I'm still learning that thing, which is one of my long-term goals, which we have goals for Oxford House employees, and this year is to get back into uh, college and do those things. After 10 years, I don't know how that's all gonna come about, but I'm willing to take the chance and go after it. Uh, they literally stole all my thunder. I mean, which is absolutely awesome. So I want to give a round of applause to the panelists today, man. They did an outstanding job. <laughs> I mean, they really covered everything that I would have brought up uh, to you guys. Uh, but as a member, I still live in an Oxford house. I, I am the outreach coordinator uh, for Colorado. One of well, uh, outreach service representative, make sure my title is correct. Uh, and I still live in an Oxford house. So I've been living in Oxford House for a little over 12 and a half years. And uh, I've yet to move out. One of these days I will, but that's my time. But that goes to tell you how the benefit of just staying in recovery and having the opportunity, if I want to stay there for 20 years, I can. Uh, other organizations, you have a time frame, you're out the door. And so you, I, I'm not ready yet. And I really enjoy the opportunity to be able to do my service with the individuals coming in that are coming out of the treatment programs off the street is like, Here, this is me, this is what I'm doing, this is what my life is about. And they say, okay, well, let me try that. So it's been an opportunity uh, to give back to other people. <clears throat> Educate yourself. That's the key thing about walking into talking to your treatment programs is if you have, ha who has, who's on the housing services at the state level? Chapter level? Okay. Have you guys ever read the manual? Yeah? Has you ever seen outreach in that manual? The word outreach? When you guys look at these manuals, you gotta remember that the outreach, we are there to support the individual states and the individual chapters. It's your jobs. When I came into Oxford House, I took on the housing services uh, representative piece. Judy Maxwell was my regional manager. I saw her twice in my area in 28 months, and one time it was before because we had the state association there. 
she allowed us to take on the responsibility as a chapter and to go out there and do what we did. If it wasn't for that part, because I was a very inverted person, I was inside, I didn't have that ability to reach out and talk to people about who I was because I had no story. It was prison, it was, it was that lifestyle. But she forced me and my chapter said, you need to educate yourself. So I started reading this manual and going on the website. I educated myself. And at that time I took on the housing services uh, committee uh, position and within, we had one treatment program that we were doing uh, the presentations at. Within six months we were doing it in seven treatment programs. And to be honest with you, I'm gonna pat myself on the back because I lived in that house. I took on the responsibility of my position of being housing services at my chapter and I ran with it and we started doing presentations in seven treatment programs within a, a 60 mile radius. You guys can do that. That's your jobs, that's your duties, that's your responsibility. It should be your give back to Oxford House as to how can I better my area? Is there any treatment programs out there that we haven't talked to? Now you might want to talk to your outreach and other people, your state association to get that information. And if there's areas out there that you're willing to go out and pioneer for Oxford House, for your area, then get out and get it done because that's why you guys are here is to educate yourself, take this back, don't stop when you get home, go for it, run with it, be a part of the program. Thank you guys. All right, thanks again to our wonderful panel. And we've got about eight minutes for question and answer. So if you've got a question, come up to the microphone. It's being taped, so just speak clearly into it, please. I don't think I need, there it is. All right, woo! All right. <laughs> Deshaun Smith, Houston, Texas. So a lot of presentations we go to, uh, one of the challenges that we hear is that we don't have enough structure because there isn't a house manager and maybe the guidelines aren't, you know, get up at this time, go to bed at this time. Um, what is something that we can do to communicate that that structure does exist, but it exists on a peer-to-peer -peer accountability? Can you hear me? I, I'll stand up so you can see me. DePaul Universities, anybody heard of those guys? Yeah, they've got about, um, I don't know, a thousand different research uh, things that they've done on Oxford House. You take that into them and show them. You can also look, it'll show them that because of the structure that we have, without the house manager piece that we vote on everything that we do this peer to peer, uh, that's why we can boast an 87% success rate. There, and tell me, who else can do that? Those other programs, show me evidence, I'll show you evidence. And, and be nice about it and be persistent with them and consistent. Keep coming back until they change their mind. Yeah, I was just going to simply say the same thing. I'll, I'll steal this from one of my good friends that, uh, you know, the bottom line for Oxford is, so I, I work for an organization where all the houses are, are managed, and, and I see, honestly, that it is a big difference. And the, the difference is, is the quality of the of the, the recovery that they're getting, it doesn't exist. Bot bottom line is, is that I can, you know, if I'm a member of Oxford, I can say something to Daniel that his PO may have said to him a month ago or his house manager or his counselor and didn't hear. But if it's coming from somebody who's sitting on the same level as him, that is the ultimate, that is, you know, the ultimate form of accountability is that peer-to-peer social model. Okay. Yeah, I, I just want to add that this is, a, this is a concern because the bottom line of that argument is that we're not capable of providing for our own. And that peer-to-peer -peer work is suspect because, it, it, because it's not clinical in nature and it doesn't have all those regulations and whatnot. And we need to argue back that if we over-regulate, we'll, we'll pull down the peerness 
that this has, has to happen on a grassroots community level, that, and we do, have, um, we, we, we do have checks and balances to make sure that things run well, but we don't want to overbuild what, what's there. And I think that we need to inc incorporate that in our language, because we know that what we have is very secure, and that, and that if something goes wrong, we have some infrastructure just enough to take care of it. Great. Okay, let's get in at least one or maybe two more questions. Go ahead. Uh, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty new uh, to Oxford, but do we, and if we don't, should we have some sort of packet, paperwork, something to take to the treatment providers when we go, talk to people, presentations and stuff? Because, I mean, we can talk to them all that stuff, but when we leave, some of it goes in here and one out the other, if we can leave something behind. So I know some of the, ch can you hear me? Yes. So I know some chapters will make the business cards that have all their houses on them and their phone numbers so that they have a way to contact them. Because sometimes when they're in treatment, they don't have access to the thing or their counselors are busy. So just having business cards, or you can call OHI and order pamphlets too. You know, just a quick thought on my end is, is uh, even things on, I think of social media, you know, on, on Facebook. I mean, I'd love if each house had a Facebook page. And on that page, it gave the address, the phone number. It gave, um, you know, uh, details about uh, what days they interview. It gave details about uh, some of the regulations or some of the rules or the structure. And so a person could quickly go to each, uh, uh, you know, uh, Facebook page for that particular house and see the details of it. And, and in that sense, you don't even necessarily have to be bringing a bunch of stuff in. You just have some, something somewhere where everybody can get access to it. Okay, so I have a question for y'all, Patricia, alcoholic addict. <clears throat> so I have been working with somebody out of Caldwell County, it's in Texas, at the jail. And um, he does specific um, GED groups and different things out of the jail. And I was trying to get a presentation together so that we can um, <clears throat> have specific people that are in programs through the jail, drug and alcohol through the jail, be able to fill out applications online so that when they do come to a point, kind of like a treatment, when they do come to a point of getting out of jail, and they've had prior um, treatment through jail, through different programs, get a computer designated so that they could get it set up, so we could set up an interview so they could come out and be able to have a, a safe house instead of putting them back into that same environment. So my question for you is, um, is this just Oxford, or is that, po I mean, is that possible for us to go further into the jails instead of these, you know, into those things? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. treatment. Yeah. Okay. That is considered yes. treatment. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And reentry. Yeah. You want to, you want to ask for uh, the release counselors. A lot of times I too would go to the AA or NA groups in the local area and, and ask them who their contacts are in the jail uh, as far as H and I. So a lot of times you can go through those same contacts and work within the jails and such. Okay, in keeping with time, just because Mr. Malloy likes us to stay on time, we're gonna go, if y'all have questions, I'm sure our panelists will be happy to answer them for you if you come on up here. So, and thank you guys.